fruitful and multiply, please. Please. No, please, the head says no. Oh, boy. Thank y'all for coming. Would you, would you pray with me as we begin our service, and then we'll sing in just a moment. Father, thank you for this day that you have given us. We pray that our worship is pleasing to you because you are a great God. You are the sovereign king of this universe, and you are worthy of our praise. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Good morning. We stand with you this morning and turn your head off to the number 555. We're marching to Zion. <laughs>
say our affirmation of faith. We're going to recite it. If you need it, it's found inside the front cover of your hymnal. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of body, and the life everlasting. Amen. I mean, if you would come forward for the offering, please.
probably has spent some time with other people on the phone and hasn't been able to solve their problem either, but some of them they may have been able to do so. If you multiply that uh, uh, for the call centers that are across the country, you think about the millions of calls and problems that people are having every single day. And even with all those options on the phone, and even talking to a live agent, the truth is some people are never able to get to the right person to get help. Can I tell you something? I'm really grateful for today that Jesus doesn't farm our prayers out to India. <laughs> yeah, he, did. he doesn't farm our prayers out to anybody else, and I am very thankful for that. In the next couple of weeks, we're going to look at things that we ought to be thankful for. Can, can I just tell you, it is a natural follow-up. Being forgiven should lead to gratitude. It should. I fear that it doesn't, but it should. And in Psalm 16, 116, we're going to see some things about which that we're going to be grateful. Today, we'll just look at verses 1 through 7 today. The, you know, the first thing that we, we should be thankful for is that he has heard us. We can see that in verses 1 through 7. And this is really the first point of gratitude that we could talk about in our psalm today. And, and is, as a child of God, you don't have to worry about whether or not Jehovah has heard you. You don't. You don't have to worry about whether or not you have used the right formula. You don't have to worry about whether you, you use the right prayer bead or not. You don't have to worry or not, or not about talking to an intermediary, somebody that's going to pray on your behalf. You don't have to worry about any of those things. You don't have to worry about whether you recited something perfectly or not. And there's no automated response that you hear when you pray. God doesn't say to us, oh, by the way, the menu has changed. Amen? Amen? It has not changed. That being said, are there times when you and I are a little bit more active praying than at others? And I think all of us would probably say, yeah. yes. <laughs> I don't think there's any doubt about that. All of us are. And then I would say this, that a lot of times when we are sailing through life, with a minimum of problems, which isn't a lot of times, but sometimes it is. Things are just going right. Does it happen to you that those are the times we really don't pray very much? I think that's probably true. But, and, and I would have to say to you that as I was reading Psalm 116 and some of the other Psalms this week and just doing some general reading, I'm convinced that there are times that God drops problems in my life to remind me that I am not in charge. You been there? And there may be things going on in your life as a reminder that there is a sovereign king of the universe who is unfolding his plan in your life and in my life. And the sooner that we pause and thank him the better it will be for us. It doesn't mean we won't have any more problems. But I do believe he uses those things to draw us to himself. Amen? That's so we. If, if you don't have trouble right now, can I tell you something? It's a comment. It just is. Lindsay, Monday is coming, right? You're going to have, how many students are you over, do you have oversight of? 800 students. That means she can have 1,600 parents show up tomorrow and tell her, why did my kid, you think I'm joking, but she knows what I'm saying. That as a principal, you never know what a day's going to hold. And we have got to pause and thank God that he is the king of the universe and we are not. 
there should be a real sense of contrast between the kinds of help that we receive here and the kind of help that we receive in the Word of God and from the King of Heaven. So let, let's look about, let's look at some things about hearing Him. One of the things for sure, you can see this in your notes, we're, we can be thankful that God has heard us, and a few things about hearing us, my love for Jehovah will move me to call out to Him. Can I, just, can I just tell you today that if your love for God isn't moving you to call out for Him, that doesn't say anything about God, but your love might be suspect. Your love said it might be suspect. You know, that's a, that's a matter between you and Jesus. But I do believe this. That, that a thankful heart, that is a heart of gratitude, naturally flows out of love. I have a loving heart. And if you don't have a loving heart, if you don't have that, then I bet you also don't have gratitude. And I will tell you, do you think we live in a graceless age? We do live in graceless age. <coughs> Though my sins they are many. Have you thanked him for that today? Have you thanked him for that today? Though my sins they are many, what? His mercy is more. That's right. The more that we love Jesus Christ, the more that we're going to want to express that love to him and for him, and that ought to be the foundational belief for followers of Jesus Christ. The Old Testament saints were reminded of that in Deuteronomy 6. You've heard this many, many times. The Shema of Israel is called Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God. The Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with a piece of your heart. Right? With all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. Every time I read that verse, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit, have you ever, have you ever tightened something so hard that the thing cracks? Now, you craftsmen out there have probably not done that, but us amateurs, do that a whole lot more than we want to realize. When I read that verse, the Holy Spirit, it is like he has just got a vice on me, tightening me to the point, trying to remind me of where my love actually is. You could look in Matthew 22, 37 to 39, where he says, Matthew says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first. This is the great and the foremost commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as you are loving yourself. And so when you look at Psalm 116, verses 1 and 2, he says, and we heard Trish read earlier, I love Jehovah because he hears my voice and my supplications, because he has inclined his ear to me, so shall I call upon him all my days, or one translation says, as long as I live. You know, I've noticed that, that when I call, and I, you know, I don't have my iPhone up here, but you know, most of us that have digital phones have programmed numbers in it, so if somebody's calling, I mean, it's really nice, isn't it? I look and it says, Dale Howard. That's not what I do. But you know, I don't even have to have Dale's number saved in my phone when he says the month. I know that's him. Why is that? Because I know his voice. Now I do have 
in my phone, but it, it wouldn't have to be anyway. You've got people in your life in the same way. You may not have their numbers in your phone, but you know their voice when you call. I can call Milton Lester. I don't see Milton at the moment, but I can. Oh, oh Milton, I see you're hiding over there. Um, I, I can call Milton, or he can call me, and I know within half a second it's him. Oh, my. And he didn't have to say this to Milton. He didn't have to do that. I know it's Milton. He, I know when I call him, and, and he picks, when he picks up that phone, and he says hello, and I say something, and he, he knows my voice just that quickly. Can I tell you that the creator of the universe, in the millions of prayers that are going up at any given moment on this planet, the moment you say, Father, he'll say, Yes, Carol. He knows you. He doesn't need call or ID. He created her. Do you think he wants to hear from her? And do you think he loves it when one of his kids cries out to him? How, how did you feel when, when your kids were younger and they came to you and you were the only one that could help them? And they came right to you and said, Mama or Daddy or whatever it was that they called you. And you relish the thought of helping them with that issue. Amen. And it wasn't, see, little Oscar in the nose right next. He's calling his mom. <laughs> you see, God knows us. He knows our voice. He knows our name. He has inclined his ear to me. That makes me love him even more. It should. Because he is a personal God. And he should be personal to us as well. That is another reason why that when we pray together corporately on Sundays, that I love gathering with the church and reading scripture and singing songs together and praying together and looking at the word together because that makes that, that reminds me that there is a group of like-minded people that call out to God. Amen? We are not alone in this thing and God's made sure that we know that. How in heaven's name is it? Now I'll leave that alone for me. <clears throat> no, I will. I don't understand how it is that people can say that they're followers of Jesus who Sunday after Sunday don't participate in a corporate worship service. I'm not talking about Zoom church. That is not church. It's not. It's good for shutdowns. It's good if you're ill and you can't come. But it is not church. As love as as much as I love watching Grace Community Church out in Los Angeles from time to time and watching John MacArthur, hearing John MacArthur preach the word of God, I'm not attending his church when I do that. Not that Zoom church is not church. Telling other people that you're a follower of Jesus while staying home on Sundays says a great deal about what you love. It just does. And I fear in evangelical churches, we've made Christianity so comfortable that it actually costs us absolutely <coughs> nothing. We've got to understand it is an act of loving Jesus and your neighbor when you are pulling your car out of your driveway to jointly praise and worship him. You are giving thanks to God when you do that. And when people seeing you leave to go and to participate in a joint corporate worship, if that's the case, it is a private act. 
It is a public act as well. Thomas Manton, I can't remember if I put this quote in, on, the, on the page or not. Thomas Manton was an English Puritan, just a, a genius theologian. He wrote this, and I love, I love this quote. He says that he said that when the heart is full of a sense of the goodness of the Lord, the tongue cannot hold its peace. Amen. <coughs> Did you, were you unable to hold your peace this last week when you were around some other people this week? But the quote continues. Listen to the rest of the quote. Self-love may lead to prayers, but love to God excites us to praise us. Man, that, that just, that drove a nail through my heart this week. Every time I would sit back at my desk, God would just bring that quote from Manson back to my mind over and over again. And I just thought, you see, when, when we were singing, when we were singing, it was finished upon that cross. Folks, I wasn't singing to you. I was singing to God. I was playing my guitar to God. So if I mess up on a song, you know what? I don't care. I played the best that I could. If I mess up, I just mess up, but my, my devotion is still to God. I'm not so embarrassed that I'm afraid you're going to hear me do a C, C when I should have played a G or something. This, this week, would you say that, that our lives, your life and my life, led more to praying because of self-love or praising because we are excited about who God is and we are thanking Him? Notice as well in, in that verse, in verse 2, He says there, He inclines His ear. What a beautiful picture. I'm gonna try to. I'm gonna try to tell this. I may not be able to. <clears throat> I remember when Doc Sullivan was getting ready to graduate the Lord. You know, Miss Doc and I had a number of council meetings at her house. And if you've ever been to one of her council meetings, you know you sat and listened while she talked. <clears throat> and that's what I did that day. And we just we just sat and. Um, you know, she told me some things, and, and uh, normally she wouldn't ask me what I thought about that, and that was fine. And so she'd just bring me some tea, and I could sort of tell how long the chat was going to be by how much tea she brought. <laughs> you know, if it was a big glass of tea, we were going to be there a while. You know, the time came when eventually she, she wound up at the uh, Methodist Hospice residence there on Quince where Cindy works, and I got summoned to the place. She wanted to talk to me. You remember, you remember the trial? And so <clears throat> she got to a point, as a lot of people do, when they're graduating the door, where you, you couldn't really hear them. And so she, she knew it was me, and she had already said she had to tell me something, so I I went there that day, and, and she was talking, but you know what I had to do? I had to lean over, and her lips were almost touching my ear. I was inclining my ear to hear her. Can I tell you that the, the God of heaven when you're praying, he inclines his ear to you. Is that not a remarkable thought? The creator 
creator of the universe loves you so much that he's inclining his ear to hear you. Amen? Because he knows your name. He knows your voice. We should pause and thank God We need to thank God for that. Secondly, my lover Jehovah will move me to call out to him in tough times. Notice in verses 3 and 4 of Psalm 116. It says, The cords of death encompass me, and the distresses of Sheol found me. I found distress and sorrow, and then I upon the name of Jehovah of Yahweh. Oh Yahweh, I beseech you, provide my soul escape. This, this deep distress that this psalmist was facing here, what was happening in the, in the psalmist's life? I can't tell you, I don't know. Because he doesn't give us the context of what was happening. And because we don't have context, we can say this, that it is a biblical principle for sure for us to call on him during these great times of distress. And as I look around the sanctuary this morning, every single one of us have had these times of distress in our lives. Every one of us. And to varying degrees, we have called out to Jehovah during those times. Have you done that? Have you been in those situations when you knew there was only one proper course, there was only one way to deal with what was happening? And the answer I know is yes. Jesus said in Matthew 11, 28 and 29, Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden. And I'll turn away from you. Not what he says. I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. The third thing we could say is my love for Jehovah will reveal a trust in his care. As I, was, as I was looking at these final uh, verses in our passage this morning, it was my favorite. Because the psalmist would have us remember who he is. Notice the scripture says that he is gracious there in verse 5. He's gracious. He is righteous. He is compassionate. One author said he is, he is gracious in hearing and he is righteous in judging and he is merciful in forgiveness. You ever gone to somebody for help who hasn't been gracious? How'd that turn out for you? It was not pleasant, I'm sure. When we read of God's gracious character, what it's telling us is this, that whatever it is that we receive, we were completely undeserving to get. And yet God in his goodness gave it to us anyway. Amen? I mean, God, God gave us the word of God to reveal himself to us. The second thing you can see is that God is righteous. And you'll notice that it is placed in between those two things, gracious and merciful. Because he had to put the word righteous in between there because we wouldn't need his grace and mercy if he wasn't righteous. We need to know that we need to know that God is going to maintain his honor. His righteousness won't be mocked. His righteousness won't be faked. 
His righteousness will be given to us when we have the Lord Jesus. The last term from passion. I know I love this one. And I'm going to get all geeky on you just for a second. More so than normal. This word compassion. It is an active participle. You may think, well, what's the big deal about that? It, in a language, it has the, it, it denotes a habit of compassion. Meaning it is God's character to be compassionate. Amen? Don't you want that for you? Don't you want that when people think about you? They think about somebody who is, as a habit of their life, compassionate. One translation says, mercy. When people think about you, when people think about me, what do they think? Hard nose? Angry? Uncaring? I mean, I don't know. Think about the way we respond to other people in need. I fear that there are other, there are times that we are more tender-hearted than others. The character of God. And notice as we draw to a close here. So it says here, gracious is Yahweh and righteous and, and our God is compassionate. Look at verse 6. He says there, Yahweh keeps the simple. He preserves, is another translation there. In identifying the character of God, he is the preserver. He is one who has a habit of preserving the mighty, the intelligent. No, that, that's not what he said. God is a preserver of the simple. We will take the time, but you can look in Psalm 19 and see what the scripture says about simple-minded there. A simple-minded person is a person who is imperfectly enlightened and needs spiritual guidance. That's me. Is that you? If so, God will keep you. The Hebrew word simple there implies one who has no control over himself, one that cannot resist the power and influence of those people around him or her. That person is subject to great peril from which there's no natural deliverance. And the scripture says that God preserves that person. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. Look at verse 7. God would have us remember those things. But then in verse 7, he says, return. Return to your rest, O my soul. For Jehovah has dealt bountifully with you. <laughs> we take just a moment and remember a couple of things that we talked about this morning. The thing that had a profound effect on me was that Manton quote, but also remembering the idea of inclining the ear. And that Jehovah inclines his, his ear to hear you when you pray. That when we call him, you know, my phone has the ability, and if you've got an iPhone that does too, to silence unknown callers. And you got that turned on on your phone? I've missed a few calls in doing that, but I'm not thinking as well that the message is important. I mean, that sort of thing. Can I tell you that in God's economy, there are no unknown numbers. When you call him, he doesn't have the button on his iPhone switch so he can't hear you. We should thank him for that. That he is ever gracious, 
He is ever righteous. He is ever compassionate. He inclines his ear to us and he deals with us. God genuinely hears us. Can I nudge you just a little bit and ask you if he's heard from you this week? I don't mean you've read the devotional and you've prayed that 30 second prayer of Lord I pray that you stay and I pray that the, you know and you're done and you move on. I, I'm talking about has he heard from you this week? Has he heard from you this week? And I pray that he has. But I can tell you this as well. Maybe <coughs> Maybe you didn't, this hasn't been a great week spiritually for you. Can I tell you something? If, if you don't remember anything else, which I hope you do, remember that God is gracious. That God is righteous. And He's merciful. What do you think he would say to you today if you have not contacted him the way you should have this week? You think he turned away from you? No. No. <laughs> Lastly, I would just say this. The only reason that God wouldn't hear your prayer is if you're an unbeliever. He hears an unbeliever's prayer when that unbeliever is calling on Jesus to forgive them and come to faith in him. Imagine the fate of people who don't know Jesus but who are calling out to a God who is not revealed. <laughs> Can you imagine? That's why he's righteous. And the message that we have today is to tell people about this merciful God, about this righteous God, about this gracious God. Would you pray with me? <coughs> Father, we, the psalmist, had great insight here. We know because the Holy Spirit inspired him. We're grateful for that. We pray that during this season of the year that our hearts would be filled with gratitude that you have redeemed us from sin. That you have given us the Lord Jesus. That we have a mission to tell people about your graciousness and your righteousness and your compassion. Or this world desperately needs to see people who are fully devoted to you. That are jointly worshiping with one another, with people who are like-minded, people that love one another, that love lost people as well. It, Lord, if there's somebody here today that's never professed faith in Christ, Lord, as we were in Sunday school this morning, I was thinking about Jonah being thrown overboard. I think about people who die without the Lord Jesus being thrown overboard, and there's no great fish to save them and to bring them to the shore and for God to continue to use. Lord, that person goes into the abyss and spends eternity in hell. Lord, let us be that safety net of the gospel for people. And we pray this in Jesus' name today. Amen. We're going to have a, a, a one verse of invitation hymn. That's going to be 453. Hymn number 453. If you need to come and spend a moment at the altar, please do that.
You can you can pray right where you are. We can talk later, or we can talk this morning if you need to.
salvation. We, uh, we have many sins, but the Lord wants to forgive us, but we already know what, what our sins are. We pray for many people that we wish to, to hear your name and the way they can receive their salvation. Uh, you cover us if we all can live in our pray. You will heal our, heal our souls and heal our nation. And that's what you give us in